This episode of Finding Demo Surf Fishing is being brought to you by DS Custom Tackle. Check out dscustomtackle.com and look at all the stuff that they have in the shop. Spot rig mini package, that's 10 rigs, $35. Different types of floats, hooks, get you all set up all the way through for your whole fishing time. Maybe you need a mullet rig, maybe you need high-low rigs, surf package rigs. Or if you're a rig tire and getting into making your own setups, they get you covered with all the equipment. Hooks, swivels, floats, you name it, they got you. Check out dscustomtackle.com, get your order in, get all set up for success. New week, baby. Here we go. Road trip time. That's right. We're heading up to New England. Right at the perfect time. I mean, hell, it's fall. Coming up on winter, it's the perfect time to be in New England fishing, isn't it? <laughs> Actually, we're doing some cool stuff. we got a lot to talk about with uh, talking about fishing up in the New England area. However, comma, we're going to be talking with Island X Lures. And we're going to be talking a lot about lures today. Uh, if you guys have been following the series here, I've been kind of pushing a little bit more on lures because hell it's one of the few things that we do quite a bit of but you don't really i don't know it doesn't seem like a ton of knowledge is out there and if it is it's kind of a little bit high level i don't know about that but i like to get into the weeds and with the different lure companies we've all had different pieces that we've been talking about and we're going to show you a whole new set right now so like i said we're going to talk to island x lures you can find them on facebook uh, Island X Lures, Instagram uh, at Island X Lures, website is islandxlures.com. And we're going to be talking with Nick. So without further ado, let's get you on the show, man. Nick, welcome, man. Welcome here. Hey, Brian, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming on. We've been working trying to figure out schedules here. <laughs> yeah, right. A couple times, but we made it <laughs> right, before the, right before the holiday break. Yeah, it's a perfect time. That perfect time. Well, that's actually going to, yeah. Uh, that's actually going to work out for a lot of people because, I mean, hell, this is the perfect time to get your hands on lures and stuff for fishing for the year. Dad doesn't want a new tie. Dad, no, Dad doesn't want a new tie. <laughs> he wants no, and worse. fishing lures fit perfectly in stockings. I, I am just starting to see that now. They really do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was just saying, I had a, I, I had sold a bunch to uh, somebody and said, these will fit perfectly in a stocking. Wow, I didn't even think of that. Like, <laughs> uh, advertise, advertise it that way. It's a perfect stocking, uh, stocking stuff. Hell yeah, man. Damn. I'm, now I'm going to have to go, you know, accidentally stuff my own stocking with it, even though my wife listens <laughs> to my episode. So she might very well have that happen, which is perfect. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so you make, they're really cool looking lures. It's, you've, you've got a bunch of different sets. I mean, it looks like, like four is your primary. But you have some really good looking lures, and they're completely different in, throughout the whole series. That's the goal. So, I mean, just like probably a lot of the guys that are at my level or well above me started out, you know, die hard into fishing, you know. So they've already fished every other lure you probably come across. And what I found myself in stores looking at was so many of the same thing. I was always looking for something different and you know, these things kind of fit that bill and then fit the bill for a lot of other things. Um, it's fishing's always situational, you know, starting out here, there were some couple key components that we needed in these lures for them to be successful. Um, and we nailed them. So on the islands, um, out here, we use them and we use them heavy, uh, because, they cover a lot of bases for guys um, to be able to throw from the shore here and from boat. Yeah, like I, I love on your website here. You're, it's it's got an on running. I guess you can't call it. A, no, it's a video, but it's uh it's the Hellfire yeah, a pencil. Looping. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that loop right there, the first one that opens. You got that striper that's just chasing after it in the at the surf, and it's like, oh, almost got it. Oh, almost got it. And then you got the other one coming off the boat and you're pulling up. It probably looks like uh looks like probably either that one Hellfire 180 or 120, maybe. Yeah. Just crushing yeah, that, that one was... striper. So it, well, yeah. So these uh a, a lot of the fishing up here is done in uh rips. Uh, you know, moving water over a sandbar, um, you know, off different points of the island, off parts of the Cape. It is a magnet 
uh, for bass and bluefish. And, you know, late in the season, Albies and Bonita. It is an easy place to start. I mean, if you had a boat, you just need a rod and, you know, a, a lure that is going to get them up. Uh, we, we like the top water bite. It's, it's too fun. So a lot of these lures that we put out are, um, had started out with top water in mind. So that video uh, shows why, you know, you get to see the strike and it makes, makes, the, makes the experience that much more. Really, love. and they and they they are so feisty behind it. They do not give up with this plug um, because we do run inline singles on it. So, what it does is it does. I mean, a lot of guys, you know, follow the same belief that it, you know the hookup ratio is a little less than running trebles. But you know, we're like I was telling somebody today, we're 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 aimed at the catch and release uh, crowd just because if you use these on a charter boat, there is nothing easier than dehooking these from a fish. It's so simple and you don't have troubles flying through the air i have yet to deep hook a fish where i was worried that when i released it it wasn't going to make it i've become a real believer in in line in the beginning when i first started fishing i'll, I'll admit it you know i was like well six hooks is six hooks man fish is going to get off yeah. if i don't hook them right more barbs the merrier yeah exactly you know and i, I was always frustrated looking at like uh these whole things you guys are talking about single inlines that's stupid what are you you're not going to catch and then i started fishing with gi jigs uh a guy out of virginia all the, came up with these ones for the surf nice heavyweight good for throwing and i was hooking up constantly with these i'm like what the hell why is this work so easy but also on with that with these blues i mean you know how blues are those teeth are <laughs> they're, they're sharp <laughs> you don't want to be yeah really no weird. we did the the 180s and the, in the 120s um those pencils are uh, it's definitely one of the best bluefish lures up here um uh, it's not like something there it's not our prize fish so i'm not proud to say that that's right. the greatest <laughs> uh, bluefish lure but i can tell you that when you take that lure out and you fish it from the beach and you see nothing going on it's my confidence lure, it's a lot of guys' confidence lures out here. If that if, if that thing doesn't get hit in the first thirty minutes of fishing, there isn't anything out there. Yeah. That's the the, the kind of strange belief that you have. Because I mean I've I've obviously fished a, a million other things and I always start with that just because it's the best way to test the waters there. We're not fishing, you know, from the shore into, you know, deep, deep water. You know, it, it, it may uh, run out to 15 or 20 feet deep to where you can reach it, the rattle inside of it, the action on the surface, it, it entices strikes like nothing else. It's, it's a lot of fun to throw. And like you can cover so much water with this thing. If you ever get your hands on it and you hold it, you can feel why it's all rear weighted. Like at the very back third or fourth of the lure is all loaded with the weight and it just casts like a missile. So oh, man. you can cover some serious water. And a lot of guys that, that do surf fish up here always find themselves shy of the breaking pot of fish. It's like a nightmare. It's the worst thing to be standing on a, on the shore, or even if you can wait out a little bit and just not be able to touch them because everything inside of it's dead. You know, you, every, yeah. there's no fish in close to you usually. So when they're, when they're involved up like that, you got to be able to reach them. Yeah. So that was pretty much the primary focus uh, going into making these was these things need to go a long way. Yeah, and I mean, that body style is going to, I mean, it's going to launch to the air, but like I was saying. It I, does, I, and the, the rear weight carries the, the end of the lure out first, and these inline singles, there's way less drag having those on. We actually, the first year we had these things, we wanted to know, so we put trebles on it, not to catch fish, but just to see the yeah, difference. Yeah, it would it wouldn't fly right. It went not even half as far. It was incredible the distance lost. Treble hooks became a, a no firmly after that. It just it completely upset how far we could throw the lure. So we, we you know that was an abandoned uh, thing right in the beginning. That's smart. And that you know sense. conservation has really taken on up here. Um, getting low numbers from the Chesapeake area. And these spawning numbers have been down. So a lot of guys really, you know, the Saltwater Guides Association, a lot of different companies really focused on conservation efforts. And, you know, we do a big raffle, a raffle that's been growing, I should say, um, 
every year just to, you know, generate a, a sizable donation to those guys to give whatever we can back into the industry because those are the people that support us. So it's nice to do stuff like that and see what we can do to help build the population back up. Some guys will tell you they don't see it, you know, and then I first a couple of times this year where I was like, nope, there's plenty of fish out here. But the numbers uh, have been down. Yeah. Uh, the last few years. So well, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Definitely a species worth protecting. Yeah. For, oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Especially stripers. And, uh, but anyway, we're, like yeah. I said, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So like, so with all this together, we've got a whole bunch of lures to talk about. We're going to definitely get back into that one. So let's get into the beginning here. For, well, tell us your story and what got you into fishing. Yeah, probably like a lot of other people's story, you know, your uh, whether or not your parent or a good friend gets you into it. Um, I did it with a few friends and, you know, once you catch that first fish, it's, uh, you're hooked. I mean, a lot of guys <laughs> the same way. It's, it's addicting. Uh, that's why we're all still here. And, but specific, and that was always freshwater, freshwater. I had, it was access for me. I had a lot of uh, access to freshwater around me. Um, in Plymouth, uh, Massachusetts, there's hundreds of ponds. Um, so I could always walk to one, but one of the time I, I fished a freshwater pond that had an outflow in the ocean and so one afternoon I hooked on I thought I had the biggest bass in the pond by far and when I got it to shore it was a striper so it was a holdover that was hanging around in there and it just boggled my mind how strong that fish was um, by comparison to anything in that pond you know it just kind of jolted me so I, everything was about trying to figure out saltwater fishing after that which thank God, I was right next to the ocean anyway so there's a lot of trials and tribulations when you start with no information. I pissed a ton of older guys off, passing over, <laughs> um, running off, getting in their spot, throwing right at the fit. You know, the stuff I would do now, you know, because I was one of those guys, I'm a little bit more uh, cordial to the, you know, hey, listen, it's probably not best to do this. I, I had a couple of those guys and I had a couple of guys that laid the hammer down on me and told me to get the F uh, out of there. Plenty of guys lost lures due to my mistakes, but and the excitement of fishing at that age, I was, I was blind. You know, it was get the lure out there as fast as possible. It was, it was, it was crazy. So we, I got learned a little bit more every year. You know, where to go, what to throw, what baits around. You know, you start to pick up information because you do want to get, you want to make your time on the water more successful. And you know, that's been a constant recurring thing ever since I started. So it eventually led me to where I, you know, this path now, uh, thanks to COVID actually, uh, in a weird way, I think that did that for a lot of people. I had never been unemployed and I didn't have a choice, uh, in that one. So we were down and out for about 10 weeks and the door opened on this and we, as soon as I opened it, I was done. You know, it's a kid lost in a candy shop, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we started really simple i think you know like the first year it, it had a different name we had 18 16 or 18 lures different lures it was it was absurd it was like we were a full-blown company all of a sudden we didn't have volume behind any of that we had a uh, hundred of anything um so we sold out a lot of things really quickly and uh other stuff i have a box i'm looking at right now that has plenty of it in there but that's the joys of getting into this business is um, yeah. some things are successful and some, some things are not. <laughs> well, with that now, I mean, you bring up the next one. What type of fishing do you like to do now? Uh, well, this year I just got a boat. Now, saltwater fishing Congrats. saltwater fishing, but there's shore fit, there's surf fishing, and then there's fishing on a boat, which a lot of guys discredit immediately. <laughs> it, is, it is a very different world. Uh, you have a lot more access on the water than you do from this from the surf. So I had some honey holes that were uh, always go to. I just needed to know that you know, I learned the tide schedules there, and I you know I didn't waste time. You're there, you were in fish. You know, more than seventy five percent of the time, um, I didn't have one. I didn't have one outing where we didn't catch any fish. So that was that's how boating can go when you're fishing from a boat. Yeah, you generally don't strike out. So. That's where I'm at now. So a lot of the stuff when we first started this company was in favor of the shore angler. Like I said, it's all about casting distance. Um, it was getting these lures to peel off as much line from your reel as possible um, because that was your only way to 
really get more of a search area uh, to touch more water was to be able to go further. And a lot of days when surf fishing was at its best is when you have a headwind, you know, it's blowing 25 in your face and nothing gets 10 yards out there. Yeah. These things would cut through the wind like a metal or a tin or whatever. And those are some of the best surf fishing days that you can get is that because the, the bait's pushed up tight to the shore, the fish are all there, they have, they corral them right against the edge and all you have to do is just get it out there. And it's usually your better, better size fish as well. So that's where it's a lot of fun. I, I'm not sure how it is down there for you. Are those nasty days, uh, better fishing or is it crisp, clear, no wind? Uh, do you have a difference? Um, kind of, but I, for me, it depends on what I'm, how I'm, what I'm fishing for and how I'm fishing. Though a south wind days where it's right in your face, exactly the problem you have right there. How far can I cast it? And you have to be prepared to be a little bit aggravated at it, but you, you can do it with the right pieces of gear. You know, if you're firing off set rigs, you, you need a, a lure or a sinker that's going to be able to cut through the wind to get out. Hey, I need that distance. I need this. You know, if you got a bunch of stuff dangling from your rig, you're just asking for drag. So you're not going to get the same luck that you should be any other time. But yeah, uh, rough wind, rough days, they can be my favorite, especially on the uh, two to three foot surf days. Oh man, that's red time. I am catching red drum. Yeah. I'm going to get them. Yeah, that's uh, those are my confidence days now. If I'm searching for days that are overcast and it's blowing, and I'm picking the side of the island that the wind's blowing in my face. That was kind of one of the first things I learned on the island. Uh, just because, you know, when you're land-based, you don't have any ocean behind you by any means. You have like, a west wind that's going to blow you in tight or an east wind. Here, I, it doesn't matter, south, north, any which direction. I can pick a part of the island and, uh, and, and do really well. So that's uh, that's that's a benefit of living on the island, I guess. Is, yeah, um, Nant- Nantucket's nice be for good. that. It just... <laughs> yeah you can go in any direction you're gonna find water you've got this now you got this into this industry too what is your favorite thing about fishing good question well <laughs> i bet i i'd have to be the style i mean the style of fishing you can see it in our offerings is is uh top water up here in the northeast is is amazing you get every species come up besides your bottom fish like uh, black sea bass or fluke but we get the a false albacore, the bonito, uh, striped bass, and bluefish, and they will all come up to the surface and put on a show with these plugs. And it's like I joke about, uh, I joke about it with a few friends. Uh, they'll never get me to throw a bucktail. I just can't do it. <laughs> I feel like it's the most boring thing. After you throw top water, it's just you know. Uh, but I'm a sucker to catch fish anyway, so I'm sure that day will come where I have to, you know, bounce lead off the bottom to get a fish. But uh, not anytime soon. We'll keep uh, working around that with whatever plugs we can come up with. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, that perfect transition into this. What's your favorite fish to target? It's so we get them seasonally. It's it's my favorite fish to target is the first one I can catch of the season <laughs> uh, because um it's been such a drought that uh, we actually have uh, I think they're hickory shad. I, I gotta be specific. I think they're hickory. They look like a little poor man's tarpon. They run anywhere from 14 15 inches and then we've seen some that got up to like the mid 20 inch range they get pretty big and that they will come in first along with the bass and they'll hang around late too but they'll trick you you think you got your first uh, striper on of the year and then you pull up this thing it looks like a giant shiner really <laughs> but they they hit just like yeah they hit just like uh just like a bass would so it can be really confusing at first but when you just like crank them in like it's nothing um uh, you kind of have an idea that you're not fighting anything with a backbone, <laughs> too much of a backbone. <laughs> that's, um, that's so much but fun. But yeah, it would be, it would be bass. It'd have to be bass. Um, I think that's a lot of people's prized fish to catch up here. They're here anywhere from May. I mean, there's holdovers. There's stuff that'll stay in these uh, outlet ponds where they can get into. I don't know. Some people believe that there's resident fish that make it here all year round. That's a really good question. I'd, I'd love to know more about that because we get guys that catch some really early from the surf and don't have any uh, lice on it, which means they were migrating. So it'd be interesting to see if that uh, if there if there actually is holdover fish when the temps get that low. But the bass do hang around from you know generally uh, sometime you know middle of May for us and until. Um, I just caught one last week, so 
they'll, they'll hang until November. So it gives you a nice long season. Um, the other species, you know, bluefish, there has actually been a few that made it into November as well here before they go down to see you. And uh, we have a really short season for the false albacore, which is the southern fish. Uh, but everyone goes crazy when they make it up here. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a quick uh, those, turning those, season for you. That That's a that's a quick flash time. Yeah, but we get, you know, we get a little taste of everything. So, I mean, summer's fleeting here anyway. It, it seems to go by so quick. So you're not really upset when you get to September because you know like some of the best fishing's coming, um, but you know it's a it's a short window before you're waving goodbye to it. Uh, so now we have six months of nothing, and that's frustrating. But... <laughs> no, it's time to go ice fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I well, Nantucket never has ice. No, you don't all. have ice. So it seems if you had we're ice controlled by the ocean temp, yeah, yeah. If you had ice, we're already in a really really bad situation. Oh yeah, everyone else is screwed <laughs> if we're under ice. <laughs> <laughs> a couple times the harbors have the harbors have frozen. Um, get some big blocks of ice in there. It's 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 pretty wild to see. Oh wow! Uh, and it is cold. Yeah, we that that usually happens January, February, and then we turn yeah. out of it. But that's about when you've said I've had enough. Um, <laughs> where the hell is it? the long wait? But <laughs> yeah, so I, I I can't answer that specifically. Yeah, yeah, any you know any of them work. Uh, just because of the way a season works. Yeah. A lot of guys, if the if the rod will bend, guys go to uh, tog fishing. Tog fishing, uh, it's another bottom one that's a, like a crab eater. It hangs around like uh, rocky structures and stuff. So a lot of guys, they're really good eating. So a lot of guys will kind of transition to that. And then it's hunting and uh, anything to keep the mind busy until it all starts again. Yeah, and you got the boat. So, I mean, you get to run out and go play on cod. I mean, you got the continental shelf not too far off. So... You, you get you oh, get the ain't nice going, run. No, 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 no. It's oh. a twenty foot boat. We're oh. not doing the perfect storm. I was gonna. Say, okay. I wish we had a nice big one. Don't yeah. Know. Well, she's uh out of commission now. Unfortunately, in one of our trips, we picked up a bundle of someone's braid. And, oh, uh, nice. Yeah, I lost all the gear oil, so she's got no prop on her right now. Uh, we're waiting to see how much money she's demanding to be fixed. Uh, the old boat owl analogy bust out another thousand. Yeah. Ugh, that hurts. Yeah. It's okay, though. Yeah. She, she did good for the time I had her right uh, this season. She's she's on break right now. Sometimes good. Well, what is a bucket yeah. list? What is a bucket list fish for you to catch one day? It's not anywhere near me, unfortunately, because then I'd probably be going after it now. But, um, I got to convince my wife to go on a tropical vacation where I spend no time with her. It'd be Costa Rica. I think I'd probably want to target him. Mm. Uh, rooster fish. Oh. But I've also, it would have to be a rooster, but I've also now been watching all these videos of Kubera. Have you ever seen those? Yeah. Um, yep. Kubera snapper. And they're taught. Yep. They hit top water and it's like a train or like a GT. I guess I could have three, right? I have three feet. Oh, you can have a hundred. Um, I mean, let's be honest. We, there's, yeah. there's really, I mean, once you catch the one bucket, then you got to fill another one. I know, but I, and I think I can get all those maybe in the same uh, same shot. We'll have to see. I got to see. I got to price that trip out and find a way to keep my wife busy while I go do all that. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, I know it's not in my dreams. It's that easy. I know it's not in reality. So I got to figure this one out. Well, but, uh, Robert 100%. Robert Field. You ever heard of him? Or Robert Field? I believe mm -hmm. it is. Uh, field field trips with him. Oh man! Yeah, I mean, with his trip that he does down at Los Busos, uh, and they're going, they're getting cuberas, they're getting roosters, and the kayaks. It's like, oh yeah, my that's god, that's two for one. Crazy. Uh, that that is another. Yeah, that would probably be maybe my second time after I'm the third. Uh, I gotta figure out how to pull that one off. I haven't. I have a pedal kayak, and I haven't put it in the ocean yet. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I transitioned transition to a boat pretty quickly, but uh, we have a lot of we have a lot of great whites out here that uh, frequent the area, and I can't shake it from my head that they wouldn't look at my kayak as a nice snack. But I mean, um, they might come look at you. We for don't a have any. We haven't had any attacks, but we always have these lovely videos of seals being thrown and torn apart, um, <laughs> really, really close to the beach. So I can just see my kayak <laughs> being torn apart. <laughs> I gotta get that out of my head. The last episode, it's funny you talk about that. So I, I just did an episode with uh, Go Fish uh, in South Africa, Go Fish Adventures, and we were talking about sharks. And he's like, you know, sometimes we do cage diving with great whites. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm good, man. He's like, dude, they're just puppies. You know, they're, 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 I have pit bulls. You know, they're not gonna mess with you. you don't mess with them. I was like, I'm not worried about their teeth. 
not even a little. They're not going to eat me. I'm worried at the sheer speed that they swim and turn around to the side and say, huh, hi. You know, I'm like, yeah. I don't need that fear. I'm good. I am really oh, good. Yeah. I look at, yeah, I look at their dead black eyes. And, nope. And then it's even worse when they cover them up. It means they're biting. So good. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I think I watched Jaws too many times and they filmed that on the vineyard. So it's really close. Yep. Well, that and Shark Week. Shark Week gets you right there. It's like, oh, so when their eyes flip, you're dead. Got it. I got it. Well, here's the problem. Shark Week it was a lot in South Africa and all these. Now it's Cape Cod. Yeah. Now it's on Cape Cod. <laughs> so you got to understand my concern here. And all of a sudden, it came home really quickly. That there's uh, great footage to be had of sharks killing things uh, right off Cape Cod. Actually, a lot of the places we fish. This is uh, the crazy part. Not making a lure for those things. No, no, I don't. No, I can under I can understand what you're saying right there. <laughs> yeah. We do have uh, we do have an unbelievable uh, beach fishing for sharks here. It's there's they're they're different. They're sandbar sharks. Um, you might get the occasional brown or the I forget the other names, but they get up to like seven eight feet, and uh, a lot of the guys get a ton of enjoyment out of it. I'm kind of a, a one once a year is great. You it's like you hooked onto a train. And, you know, you're just cranking on this thing for half an hour, 45 minutes, yeah. you get it to shore, it scuffs you up, um, probably have a really good chance of <laughs> cutting something open. Uh, and then it goes back in, you take your picture and it's gone. But not really my thing, but I know that we have, there's been drone footage of, I mean, 10 feet off the shore and you're seeing groups of them, 20, 30, you know, and then you can write down the beast there everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People are. You know, people walking out there, thank God they're not, you know, vicious. Uh, they don't attack humans, but are not, it's not documented. Yeah. Like it's not like they're targeting us like, ooh, leg of fatty. Yeah. Mm, what you can't mind. see under the surface. That's the worst <laughs> part. <laughs> well, now's a perfect, now that we've done that, let's move into the fun stuff here. Let's do a fun little transition piece. It is your first bait check of the episode. All right. So it's the first set of here. That means you should have brought your line in. Take a look at all your stuff. Make sure it's still good. Make sure you don't have nicks in that line. Make sure you got good bait. If you haven't caught fish yet, change that bait up. Throw it back out there. Let's try another round in between these bait checks. Make sure you're good. This bait check is being brought to you by The Sinker Guy. Head on over to thesinkerguy.com and take a look at all the stuff that Chip's got going on in The Sinker Guy Garage. Sinkers? Oh, it's in his name. Of course he's got them. Lots of Sputniks from different weights, different setups that you need. If you have a certain request, reach out to Chip. He might be able to accommodate that. What about the Bruno rig? Nice high-low that's been doing awesome things, catching tons of fish down here on the east and west coast of Florida and throughout the country. Also, that good old, my personal favorite, and I will say that here on this show because I do use it a lot, the Mortician rig. One of the most versatile rigs for you to use out there fishing you want to change out your snood for with beads or floats you can do it real quick if you get bit off no problem you don't have to change the whole rig you just change the one snood ready to rock and roll any kind of other terminal tackle you might need he's got it so reach out to the sinker guy find out what you need or get all the things you need taken care of he'll get you set up for success well, now that we've moved into these pieces here, we're moving into my favorite topic which is also known as the fishing tips tricks and knowledge also known as steal your knowledge section so we're talking about your fishing style. Um, so before you head out the door, how do you plan your fishing trip? That's a, well, if, if I get out the door, we'll start there. When I do get out the door, when I do get out the door, it is usually first thing in the morning. Um, I do have a full-time job outside of this. So I am obligated for eight hours a day to another venture, but I try and get out for that early morning bite. Luckily, the early morning bite is one of the best. So, unfortunately, if I if in a perfect world, um, I'd be running it based off my tide selection. You know, wind, you know, wind, weather conditions, um, time of the year, you know, in different locations on the island. Um, and I'd probably fish at night a lot more. But in reality, uh, yeah, I fish a block of time between five, uh, four thirty, you know, five in the morning till just about seven when I'm running to my truck and showing up to work covered in sand. <laughs> what? I don't know but what I've happened. I've had some really, yeah, I've had some really good sessions uh, in that time though. I can't, uh, I can't complain. Okay. So after you've done, uh, so how do you select a spot then when you're, uh, when you finally get to the beach to go out there? I'm a sucker for going, I, I learn spots and I, and I, and I 
I fish them hard. So I tend to go to a lot of the same spots. Uh, one, because I know uh, where to target them there. Um, we have a lot of, like I said, we have rips and moving water around the island, and that's generally when the tide's, you know, tide's moving um, or you know, falling or dropping. And it's highly productive whether you're right off the beach or not. So I'm looking for spots where... You know, I have a hole and a wash over so I can get uh, some fish that are holding in these deep, deeper pockets and deeper pools waiting for bait to wash, wash over. And uh, it's almost a guarantee sometimes that you're going to, you're going to, you're going to get it some fish. Um, sometimes I'm, like I said, I'm constrained by time and I can only go at a certain time. So I may have slack tide or no tide at all, no water moving when I'm out there fishing. And I tend to have to fish it harder or get lucky that they're, uh, you know, cruising in pods looking for bait and uh, w- willing to pick off the plug itself. I've had a few of those days. They're a little less productive, but it's all about catching at least one fish in an outing to not make it a skunk. Yeah. Well, you're talking about tides. Uh, do you have a preference? Like, hey, I like the high tide the first two hours before and after low tide. W- what are you What are you hoping for? I like to try and show up for uh, the falling, the high tide falling. I like a little bit more water. Some of these holes, you know, aren't really deep. So at low tide, you know, it's they're, they might not have some of, uh, and especially during the morning hours or early day, they might not have some of those better fish in it. Um, they may have moved off. But during the high tide, I seem to have done a lot better or better quality fish when the water's moving and it's a little bit deeper. I have a little bit more room to work with, I think. Makes sense. But, at, well, because we, we do have so, some areas tight to shore that, you know, when it is low tide, you're you're walking out there in, in a, a foot or two of water. But you get the high tide moving in, you get three to four feet, and some of these holes are much more accessible to the fish. And you know, they're, they seem to get, you know, bound up in there and just in a feeding frenzy with whatever comes over that uh, leading edge. So I'll tend, to, I'll tend to focus if I'm on shore. If I could take the boat out, and, and this is another fantasy, during the week <laughs> when I, when I want to fish, uh, I go out in the morning and I would hit, uh, some of the low tides cause they really, when the water's lower like that, the, it's really cranking across like these sandbars and, you know, churning stuff up. Um, some of the fish can get really aggressive and, you know, the, it dumps over into a deep, uh, side of the sandbar. It goes from, you know, six, eight feet down to, you know, 40 feet. So at low tide, it's not really as impacted, but the water is moving quickly. So they tend to be center around that tide change where you have uh, coming into low or the, or the turn of low. So there's a lot of different factors. I mean, out here, I mean, not everyone's fishing the same. So I mean, that's just me where I'm out here when I get time. So first, yeah, first off is do I have time to, uh, second off is, uh, the conditions are irrelevant unless I, all the stars align, okay. which is not often, but, uh, <laughs> Oh, I do have epic days. I have epic days when, you know, the tide lined up, you know, we have a moon phase that worked out and some of the, you know, the bait is thick in there and, you know, it's, yeah, I don't want to, I almost could call out of work, but I can't. <laughs> can't Stay there all day. Some, something about, no, no. you know, do I want money? What's rent? Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. It's yeah. not a big deal. No, I totally get that, man. Oh, no, I, it's not, it's always money. I've done it on like the 4th of July and where I, a lot of these places I go to fish, there's no cell phone service. Uh, the cell phone service is dead. So it's nice. I'm not bothered. But when I walk off and everything starts coming in, I'm in so much trouble because <laughs> I got lost in my own time. I was gone for hours and hours and hours. And all of a sudden, you know, I got to come home. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that's, that's fair. I, I saw the messages. I'm not, I'm, I'm not being welcomed home. <laughs> I'm in trouble. You have a choice, sir, and I recommend you choose wisely. Okay, uh, I'll be right there. I get that. I get it. Get to clean it or something. <laughs> so, uh, when you get out to the beach, um, how are you fishing? Are you doing set rigs? Are you throwing your lures? What What is your preference on surf fishing? It's, so, I know you guys throw a lot of bait. We guys will appear it's really good during the day when you have some you know uh some finicky fish that really just aren't gonna uh touch lures any you know they get a they get a clear look at it you know they're not in a feeding mode um but you know a chunk of bunker or mackerel or squid sitting on the bottom 
you know, why not? So that's, you know, a lot of guys will, will, will shoot and fish the bottom with fresh chunk bait, uh, cut bait, and uh, have success for sure. Really on this island, I mean, it's, it's, it's heavily favored in the other direction with guys that are fishing plugs. You know, it's like over 75% of the guys throw lures out here and are, are really successful with it. But in top water, because of the pro, the way that the beaches are structured, you know, top water is definitely one of those favored styles of fishing. I said you cover a bunch of water. It's really fun when the fish are on the plug, you get those big white water splashes, and it's easier. It's a little, a little more entertaining than, you know, kind of sitting waiting on it. I mean, I wouldn't mind having a few rigs out there and having a couple of beers uh, <laughs> on a Saturday and having a you know, a barbecue and hanging that that's kind of like would be my uh, style of fishing. If I was going to uh, throw some bait out there, doesn't need my constant attention or my arms not rendered useless after a thousand casts. <laughs> yeah. I can kind of balance everything. Okay. So you're like, so you prefer, and a lot of people out there are throwing the lures and the rigs and you're throwing a lot of top water that that's your happy is the top water that you have set up. That's where my perfect day exists is throwing just top water yeah, makes sense, <laughs> man. all day. But, you know, uh, I have been swayed. Uh, we have been starting to move into throwing some subsurface swimmers into the mix. Um, you know, top water doesn't work everywhere. It's not everybody's thing. And it's just some places just not productive. I mean, New England itself is is highly productive when it comes to top water. A lot of guys out here do it. Yeah. But, you know, start to move south and, it, you know, be, it's it's a different it's a different world. So that's where we're trying to, to learn more about and get involved with to try and offer products that are going to help guys outside of our general area that could be used here as well. I mean, it's just, you got to keep your uh, mind open as to what, what works and you, you can get hyper-focused on one thing. It's definitely not good for the company to do that. Okay. Makes sense. So well, try and uh, broaden our horizons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Offer. Grow, grow or die, right? Exactly. Let's move into a little bit of a strange situation here. So let's say you're going to go, you're off the island and you're up at the Cape. When you're going to go to a new place to go fish, what do you do? I go to the tackle shop. <laughs> there you go. Always go to your local, always go to your local tackle shop. Uh, you had those guys, they're a wealth of knowledge. Um, they definitely want to let you know, they might not be giving away the greatest spots out there, uh, but they're going to give you something that might be highly productive your best chance of catching something. So if I'm in an area I'm not familiar with, I'm going to Google and get myself or find bait and tackle sign somewhere and uh, get in there and, uh, and talk to the owner of the shop or whoever's behind the, uh, the desk and figure out uh, what's going on. I mean, in the Cape area, New England area, um, obviously I wouldn't have the same difficulties I could probably pick up and go uh, in a lot of areas and, and, and do all right. I'd like to pick, I can look, you can look at a, Google Maps is helpful. I do look at areas from that uh, just because some of those overhead satellite images can show you washovers, show you some of the outlets, deep pockets. You know, you can really read a lot from those. Sat they might be uh, not as up to date as you need, but I think they're pretty good. But you can find areas that would likely be fishy, you know, that you can get out there and, and, and probably catch something, you know, knowing which tide's best and, you know, what what baits there right now, you know, that's the tackle shop's going to get you that information. So there's ways to be highly successful in areas that you don't know. You know, if I was to go down towards you, I would, that's exactly what I would do. I, I mean, it might cost me more, you know, I might not have the right setups on hand, but getting the proper rigging, getting the right bait, um, tackle shops are the, are the best, best place to go, obviously. And hopefully, you know, the ones that are highly reviewed that are, are nice when you walk in and willing to uh, get you set up. But I know most guys, a lot of the guys we, we deal with that have my lures in their shop are, are just stand, stand up guys. They're, they're customer first. They're, they're highly knowledgeable as well, especially about their area. Yeah, I love, I love the ones like that. We've, we've definitely got that down here. Um, my local one right up the street, you know, my closest one, Half Hitch. And you can walk in there and they will happily tell you what's biting, where's it biting, how's it biting uh, without giving you somebody's secret honey hole but you know they'll happily tell yeah. you yeah they, they're all for it you know you, you can go down the street into fort walton beach and then you're going to get into the same thing when you start running like emerald coast bait and tackle it's the same same thing yeah the, every all the ones here 
I have ever had a conversation with is all about the angler. In the end, they know, look, you're going to buy stuff. It's cool. But I'm going to tell you what's working, what's not working, and not BS you to just say, hey, cool, I filled my coffer. They really care. Well, yeah, they also didn't get into being either the owner of a tackle shop or working at a tackle shop to not want to be involved in that community. Oh, yeah. Um, that's the big part for me, and that, especially with this, is, is getting guys and you know, people engaged in fishing that whether they – are brand new or been at it for a while with no success when that light switch turns on it's it's awesome it's awesome to see somebody walk out there and be successful you know they're another crack addict to fishing uh, <laughs> yeah. so that's we have a few on the island where you know they uh, they, uh, they frequent the stores all the time now. you know they have to have the new this the new that and it's it's good for them it's good for the shops um we we don't do anything with the Amazon specific, you know, those types of things. We don't. There's no win in that for us to take business away from the shops we service. You know, that the shops that we put our product in. Um, those guys are the ones that are out there every day that that definitely deserve your attention. And like I said, you're just not going to get that type of knowledge from Amazon or Bass Pro Shops or, or you know anything like that. It's just not going to. Uh, it's not going to be the same. No, no. I mean, that, that local, that local knowledge is everything. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, that's one thing I love about it, and you just can't small business helping small business. I mean, that's exactly. huge in our world now. The monsters are going to be out there forever. They're, they've got it covered. They've got the market. It, it is what it is. But the little mom and pop, yeah, that's that's the one helping and helping. So. But when you're, yeah, you're into it, those, those, the mom and pops are superstars. Yeah. Uh, once you're in the fishing industry, those are your, that's your intel. That's where you, I mean, unless you're, unless you are the intel and you're the one fishing every hour of the day and know the spots, um, you gotta, you gotta ask questions somewhere. And they're the ones that get information from a lot of people. So, um, if you get in with them and you get on their good side, you might get that honey hole. You might get that one spot that's, uh, a little bit better than the other ones. Yeah, it's true. It's a really good true point right there. If you're out there fishing, uh, how do you adjust your tactics when the bite isn't on fire? That's a good question because, like I said, and, and for me especially because I don't really, I mean, I've been fishing the stuff I produce pretty much exclusively. I don't really deviate too much because I really want to know every possible way to fish these things you know in any scenario um and every scenario is obviously offers something a little different so what i'll start to do is you know i'll, I'll run my go-to plug for a little bit given the scenario in front of me whether it be early morning midday you know late in the afternoon cloud cover what bait i think's around yada 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 so i start there and i will start with the yeah, how far I'm casting, I'll, I'll try and obviously touch as deep as I can. And then I'll try, you know, throwing half, I'll try and tight, you know, I'll, I'll move it, I'll move the plug where it lands around a little bit. Because sometimes when it hits the surface, some of the, it, it'll generate interest from the fish as it's like a, it just escaped a fish attacking it. So it might actually draw a strike in that regard to where as you throw it a quarter mile out there and those fish are in tight and you just kind of walk it past them you know, they may show no interest at all. I've actually, I've had that happen quite a bit, actually. Um, it was kind of mind boggling. Cause I'm like, throw it as far as you can and getting nothing. And then you have that one mistake cast and it goes nowhere and it hits yeah. you pop it once and it gets, <laughs> it gets blown up on and you're like, oh my God, I figured it all out. Uh, so there's that, those ways. So I'll, 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 I'll start with that. That doesn't work. I'm changing color. I'm going right into different color patterns, and I'm not leaving those on for very long because I covered the distances. I'll, I'll systematically go through and cover different depths, uh, different colors, and then move on to the next one. I'll exhaust the top waters for as long as I can. I'll change uh, sizes um, so I can throw a smaller profile, uh, and then I'll even I'll go bigger. Uh, sometimes throwing the bigger plug generates a strike. It's it's really strange. Um, it's hard to put a science behind it because it seems random at times, but I have seen a change in profile size with the same exact lure generate strikes. And for a while, you know, you just never thought the fish were there and all of a sudden like a, a switch is turned on. It really can be. Um, and that's where we really got into colors. That is a heated debate for a lot of guys yeah. as to whether fish can, can trigger the color sense. Can they, can they see these colors that we're presenting to them? 
Uh, we don't have anything, if you look at our lineup online, we don't have anything so elaborate. Maybe some of the customs I do just to kind of keep it uh, interesting. But most of, the, most of the base colors, you know, a white with a little bit of red on it. You know, we have a translucent amber, which up here is probably one of the most lights out colors you could fish. It's a distressed squid. When you see squid fleeing um, from a pack of fish, it lights up this orangey, burnt orange color, amber color. And uh, a lot of guys, a lot of guys believe that that color alone stimulates strikes just because it puts the fish in the mo that that fish are chasing this thing and they and they themselves have to go after it again yeah, is I, it can't be a hundred percent but you, you fish a million times you know you should have an idea of what is causing what and that's what we see in a lot of those colors is that they're reactive bites almost yeah. um, in certain certain circumstances uh, to colors so yeah I go I run the gamut I run the gamut and then you know if it's that bad I'll start fishing subsurface stuff. That's the low point of my because <laughs> uh, I throw it out there and I, you know, I'll change it up. I'll do, I'll twitch. I'll really slowly retrieve down. I'll speed it up, but I can't see the lure. I don't, I, I mean, I'm just envisioning that it's doing exactly what I want it to do in the water, you know, cause when you're casting from the beach, you don't get sight of it until the last like three or four yards before it hits the sand. Yeah. So, yeah. I find it funny Boring. when you talk about the size difference too, though, you know, you can get this, real big chunk of bait and throw it out there and this little fish comes up and hit it and you catch it and you're like dude what were you thinking what, what, what were yeah. you gonna oh. do with this lure i mean where were you gonna go no you're about <laughs> four inches longer than the lure uh, <laughs> if if you make it to be a big fish you're gonna be an absolute monster yeah. uh eating anything above itself which always you know that that brought us we bait so in in all those lineups of pencils we we made a nine inch one just because that was the logical step. We got to push this lure up to a certain size to see where it gets ignored, you know, and it isn't productive. But in that comes a, uh, you know, understanding how weight distribution works inside the lure, um, you know, the body width to the length. Uh, so many different factors affect that when it comes to like castability action. Um, the hooks, it's incredible. A lot of guys don't switch to inline single hooks because they think it's going to affect the action of the lure. Um, and in certain circumstances with a really finely tuned lure, it will, but we, that's kind of what goes into when I put these lures together is that they can be swapped out. The action isn't going to be affected. You know, maybe one reason we run, haven't run a lip swimmer yet. A lip swimmer is really probably the most susceptible to swapping out those trebles for singles, but you know, top water, we have a lot more leeway. The action really isn't affected as bad. Or you wouldn't notice it at all, to be honest with you. But um, when it comes to subsurface stuff, uh, the balance of that lure, you're talking grams, you know, very, very minute amounts of weight adjustment, and it can throw the whole thing off. Um, it's pretty interesting. So we go through all those phases when we build these things. You know, I, I you know, reject a bunch before we ever finally get to the right weight, which delivers the right action um, with the hooks that with the hooks that we want on it. That has to be incorporated into the creation of the lure is knowing what you're going to rig. Well, now so that's been, perfect, uh, man. You, I've stolen plenty of your knowledge, man. I'm excited. So the next, <laughs> the next thing we're talking into. Yeah, is, I mean, oh, what's that? Oh, I was going to say the next section you're really going to love because now we're talking. No, we're going to talk exclusively about all your rigs and everything about it. So I'm I'm excited. So before we do that, we got to make sure we end up doing the important thing because it's been a little while here, people, and you need to check your bait. This is your second bait check of the episode. So hopefully you've caught a bunch of fish by now. And if you haven't, why? What happened? What's going on? Maybe you need to change your depth. Maybe you need to change how far out you threw it. Hey, we were just talking about it. Maybe you need to change the size that you have. Get it all lined up and change it up a little bit. Hopefully you're going to catch some fish because the fish have got to be there. They got to be because you're there. This bait check is being brought to you by Ninja Tackle. Head on over to ninjatackleva.com and get your order set in for, why not, a brand new rod for Christmas or any time of the year, let's be honest. The Ninja Dagger series running all the way from 7 all the way up to 12 foot. I have those rods. I love those rods. They are some of my favorite. My go-to rods, that 7. I don't leave the house without it. Doesn't matter what kind of fishing I'm doing. I'm taking that rod with me. You need rigs? He's got them. Maybe you want to take a look at some uh, old conventional reels. Accio series. Got them in there. Other rods are available for purchase as well. Rigs, plenty of them. Bait, plenty of them. 
plenty of them. Maybe you need an optic for one of your firearms or maybe a firearm accessory. That's the Ninja Tactical side. They got you covered there. Head on over to ninjatackleva.com. Get that order in. Awesome customer service. And you're going to be loving it, I promise. Well, now that you're uh, done with this bait check and now we're moving into the fun stuff here and you're a, I don't know, kind of a lure maker, heavy into the topwater world, let's talk about it. So tell us about your rigs. Yeah, so that's kind of where we started. It's, I mean, again, I thought we talked about it a bunch. It's oh, we have, but there is my, so much like, more, dude. I know there is more. I know. No, there is. It's it's uh, in the development of this thing. You know, if 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 you kind of if you pulled it up online or on the website or anything, there's one. It's the 180 size. Um, that was the initial lure that the company came out with, and it was. Uh, hard to explain the reaction to it. You know, the, the, we, we got um, a few of these put together and we told the manufacturer, listen, you know, I'll wake this thing up, you know, make sure there's open cavities in there. We're going to kind of go against the grain of what they they were doing. You know, that's our inexperience in making it is we're going to load it with lead and uh, get it to throw as far as possible. And ironically, in that situation, we struck gold with the the first lure we came out with, which was that 180. It's was a lure that was generally expected about a three quarter ounce weighting system. Uh, we doubled it. We we more than doubled it, and it casts like I said a country mile. Uh, that was our one goal. You know, then goal two was all right. The presentation of this lure. A lot of stuff that we throw out here looks nothing like a bait fish, but it casts forever you know there'll be chunks of plastic you know block or you know very nondescript looking lures but you know they'll catch bluefish they'll 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 catch a lot of species but it's because they cast so far so we wanted to have something that that could do that but also had the appeal of an actual looking you know bait fish so this lure fit that mold perfectly and then what we found out was is that that weighting system is actually ideal but it was sinking. A lot of guys really haven't got into throwing sinking top water uh, because generally with top water, you're associating a floating lure with that. These, uh, the first generation of these things are not. That's why they cast so far. But what we found in that was, yeah, you can't pause it for three, four, five seconds. It'll submerge. But what it does is during retrieve is all that weight that's held in the back end of that lure almost grabs it into the water from the belly hook down and you can manipulate it uh top same as any other top water lure and what it'll do is it'll slash and pivot off that belly you know right where that belly hook is and slash and splash it's got a rattle in it it makes a commotion on the surface and in our first year we found out it drove drove fish crazy and that's kind of how we landed with that one. Everything after that's been like, all right, let's tweak this. Let's do this. Like I said, that's when all the doors open and you kind of get lost in this. Um, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. But you can go a million different ways uh, when you start creating a lure. And every time we do open up a new project, um, there's new uh, different focuses. You know, we're trying to work on the wire through, you know, we want to make sure that these things are extra durable and can be have multiple applications, you know, looking to put these things onto anywhere from inshore species to offshore species. Because once you mold something, I said it goes through 3D development. Um, I actually start with clay. It's funny. I have clay all over my shop here and I mold these things out by hand to get a really general idea of the body style, the shape um, that I want within the back of my head, having the weighting system in mind. Um, and then it gets brought into, it gets 3D, uh, 3D, drawn 3D. I don't, I forget the program, um, but we're able to get this thing designed digitally. Um, and that's where we can really tweak things and get it, you know, get the specs the way we want them. And from there, then now you have uh, 3D printers. Uh, 3D printers have changed everything can print out a mold of anything. And it's almost like a skeleton version of what you're gonna be producing. The weight chambers are built in, everything can be added in. So you can completely A to B this lure and get it almost ready 
for as it would be fished normally. And that actually happened this season. Most of the time, they're pretty, pretty flimsy. You know, they're super glued together. Um, like I have one in my hand here. Um, yeah, there's a super glue bead that runs it. And it looks just like the lure, uh, just a solid white color from the 3D printer. But I t we test the action that way. You know, it's rigged up. It's ready to go. So it's basically a, a spitting image of what the final product would be, minus, you know, color and eyes and all that stuff. And we actually had one of the new lures that we we're going to release next year had been super glued a little bit better than the other ones it seemed, and we have been beefing up the wire the wire the wire diameters on these um, like I said to kind of get into to be able to see these go in the offshore market a little bit um, because they have such application here and they're so successful in our area that um, we really want to see what they do with tuna and you know be nice to catch a rooster on it or compare it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know so that gets factored in and we were able to throw it this fall and uh, i fortunately i forgot to tell the gentleman i was with that uh this thing is held together by super glue so please don't hook up just test the action and stuff and his second cast in he was on <laughs> like, well, there goes I keep these things. I they're mementos to the start of the lure. You know, if it ever becomes something, you know, very, very successful. I'd love to have the three D printed version of it from the beginning. So yeah, I was in a mild panic that I'm like, all right, you're just nothing's gonna come back here. We I still have that uh lure that we're discussing. Did he he must have caught twenty or thirty fish on it. So what what it was is the wire at a, at a at a mill and a half, so it's a one and a half millimeter uh, wire, gauge wire. It held up the entire way. It took all the all the force from the fish. And these bluefish, or I, I mean, I'll have to send you some photos of it. But these bluefish were in the you know thirteen to fifteen pound range. They were over thirty inches long. They're big, big bluefish, and just twisting and torching on this thing. I'm like waiting for any second for this thing to fall apart. But after we caught you know a dozen of them. I can't believe it, but it's the wire alone that's, you know, there's no, there's no tension on this body. There's no torsion trying to split this body apart, even though it's just glued together. And yeah, I still have it uh, here at the shop. Uh, so I was lucky enough to be able to keep it, but it just shows you that there, it, it works just like the final product would. It's a 3d printed version, but with the 3d print, it's, you know, uh, the two sides of the body, are really difficult to get to stay together. Yeah. So if I'm understanding you correctly, as you're talking about this, so it sounds like you've got one main wire that's the main, like at the eyelet at the tip, and then all the way down to the uh, tail end, stern of the, the lure, that's taking all the tension. The lure itself, like that one, the body was just pretty. And, and we, you were testing yeah, the action it that was, way. It was just a shell uh, to the so wire. Cool. Um, some of the early, yeah, some of the early ones we have of, uh, you know, some of these have... Uh, Call them, they call them figure eights. Uh, they're, each one is individual and it's locked in the body through, they're laid over like a plastic post inside the body. The body's welded together, which secures this uh, figure eight wire to the post. So, you know, you see the eyelet and if you were, it's symmetrical on the inside. So you break this body open. It's literally the shape of the number, the letter eight, uh, but it sits over a post on one end inside the body. So it secures it. It can be twisted, but it can only handle so much um, torque and torsion before, you know, it'll kind of rip out of the body. Yeah. So that had been a common cause uh, with that lure, although it's so successful, it, it had a failure rate on it. And you start to get into bigger fish, you know, none of us like to lose fish at the fault of, uh, of the lure that, yeah. that, that blame is placed solely on me. So, uh, everything that we do now is with that in mind. That has gone so far up the list, you know, in terms of what's important on this lure that, you know, other things can be more of an afterthought. But the durability of it um, is, is definitely like a top three on it to make sure that there is no failure. So a big one was having these this thicker gauge wire to kind of, absorb some of the shock of that fish when it's, you know, twisting, it puts a lot of torque on this lure. If that wire through, you know, isn't able to budge off center, it's not able to split that body. So we saw it firsthand with the blanks, like I said, that was super glued together when yeah. 
in other cases, it just, the body blew up, you know, and we lost it. We just got a wire back and which was great because it just showed the wire was strong enough to hold yeah. the split ring and the hook on it. You know, the body was gone, but yeah, it's fun. That part of it's really, really probably the best part of, of this, you know, it's a lot of stress thinking about, you know, a lure cause and bringing one out because the price point is just massive. And that's what I mean. When you go through the molding process, you've, you've got to be sure uh, because you could financially set yourself back a ways as you grow this company by making a wrong decision on something, you know, looking at a lure, putting it together. You know, this is going to be great. Um, I have a couple here actually at my shop that uh, they're still being tweaked to make, you know, to get that, that quality aspect uh, brought up to par with what is the expectation is up here. But, you know, mold fees are in the thousands initial runs, uh, hooks, at all the accessories that go on these things. All of a sudden, you start building this thing. Oof, better be careful yeah. how much uh, I got. This, this, this doesn't have a choice. It has to be successful. <laughs> uh, so there is a lot of thought that goes into these things. Um, I mean, as you would imagine anyways. I mean, and that's at the level that we're at. Uh, mm-hmm. When you get up to a Yozuri or Shimano or any of these, Rapala, it's, I mean, you have teams, you have teams and teams of, uh, guys, you know, entire workshops that are, their primary focus is, you know, that company, one thing, um, I, I'm a thousand percent sure my manufacturer has all sorts of companies that they take care of. Uh, so I am not a top priority for them. So a lot of this stuff, you know, that you, maybe you would think that would be kind of, uh, assumed or thought for uh, when you know a lure is put together uh, is not at, at my level anyways it's I gotta go through every, everything needs to be considered before I press go we started talking about the the lures themselves and it looks like a lot of the I mean you have four different designs on the website and with we've been talking a ton about the uh, hellfire 180s there and you got the hellfire 180 120 and the 200 and now you've got the sidewinder minnow and these are the top producers that are popping up but if you come onto the website the first one that comes up the hellfire pencils then you're into the stinger minnows the sidewinder minnow and the tracer minnow how did you come up with uh the design for them well so it's really hard to come up with a design that's not mimicking something else right. in a lot of ways. I use Instagram to connect it to people, but like I, I, I do follow stuff and it's only, it's just fishing. It's, it's companies over in Italy, the Mediterranean. Yeah. That would be a destination spot to go fishing. Oh, um, yeah. It's unbelievable. Companies like Jack Finn and uh, some of these Italian uh, lure makers, they're just, they're up there like with Japan, they're just, on the leading edge of this and I like to see what they put out um, and you realize that when you look at something that they do you look at something that's available in our market and you know different areas that the, you know body shapes and styles you know you can you can twist and tweak a little bit and be a little bit different but there's nothing you know it's very hard to get outside of that you know there's just there's just certain stuff that you know works but also has to sell so coming up with a design is kind of taking in all of that in no way, shape or form. Are we going to try and copy anyone's success? I see it everywhere and I, I, I hate it. And if, and if we're doing it, unfortunately I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not aware that we're, that we were doing it. So please excuse us. <laughs> but that's, uh, that, and I don't think so. I mean, take the, uh, the stinger mineral, like I said, this, this one's been worked. Uh, this is the third season I've worked on this one to get it perfected. Uh, there's a half barrel swivel built into the back of the body, um, that runs freely. So you have this willow blade that freely spins off the back of this lure. Um, now it runs just a two watt inline single off the belly, but the actual body shape is what generates the uh, swim action on it. It doesn't have a lip or anything like that. So it's a, it's a really fun search bait to throw because you can do a lot with it. You can, you know, if you race it fast enough, you can get it on the surface and, uh, and, and get a surface bite, which of course I love to do, but (laughs) you can, you know, we had a lot of, we fished it the last, uh, I fished this at the beginning and the end of the season. The bass really love this thing. Um, there's just, if you're dealing with murky water, this willow blade grabs whatever light is penetrating the water and refracts it. And you're able to get 
just that little flash of light as this thing's kind of scurrying through. And then, you know, the fish picks up on that and the action. This is one of those ones we'll have it where because, I mean, yes, because of the inline singles, but you'll, you'll feel the fish before you hook up. You'll, you'll, sometimes you'll feel it hit it like three, four times. It almost like somebody grabs it and pulls it back from you, just, just taps it. Boom, boom. And they'll, and you can tell that there's like either one really aggressive fish or you got a, you got a, you got a little school of fish chasing this thing down and literally sucking in the back end of it. But once they get that hook, then it's done. So it's kind of fun. You know, you really try and slow it down. You know that you've been hit like three times and then you hook up, but it was like all fall like that. Uh, some of them, when they're obviously in a feeding frenzy, just inhale the thing. Uh, which makes it a lot easier. But when they're being finicky, this is it's a great lure to throw at them. But same same design tag. This one has a uh, it's a one mil wire through. Uh, we for a four inch, uh, it's just over four inches. But for a lure that size, it's an ounce and a quarter. It throws equally for anything its size uh, or further. Um, plus, it's it's a lipless swimmer, so you can kind of run it like a swim bait you know, freely uh, up and down the water column and an ounce and a quarter, it gets down, you know, if you run it at a really slow retrieve, you can get it, you know, running 10 feet below the surface. So it's versatile. That's another part of what we're trying to do is anything that we put out there has versatility, can be fished in a bunch of different situations. You yeah, can obviously change that by throwing, you know, on a, like next year, this ounce and a quarter we're going to bring down and have one that's one ounce. We wanted that heavy weight for the casting. But when you bring the weight down, the swim action is more, more prominent. You can see how much, how smooth it is compared to when the, he the heavier weight is going to basically kill off a lot of the action, uh, unfortunately. So it's a trade. It's a balance. We, we wanted to kind of give up some of the action for the ability to touch further out. And now, obviously, having fish from a boat, you know, the reverse is kind of in effect here. We need to find the balance between weight and action. So that one ounce was um, right on the money to get to work for both, you know, to be able to still throw it well from the beach and for both guys to really utilize it and get that action to generate more strikes. Yeah. And that willow tail, I mean, that willow blade right there, that's going to give you so much vibration in the water. That's going to attract a lot too, because they're going to pick up on that sense. It did. So what, um, we actually went up one size this year as well. Um, it kind of tinkered with it in the fall and more light, more vibration. It was like, click. it was getting hit much more than the other ones, um, ran them side by side. You know, a final product in, in my eyes is something that, you know, is going to make it, you know, last 10 plus years, you know. Yeah. Um, so it may take a few years to get it right where it needs to be last that long to be in the industry you know and, and a successful i, I don't you know, i'm not talking about lures that don't <laughs> aren't proven successful i need we have a short lineup they need to all be fish catchers you know? yeah. it can't be uh there's nothing that can sit on the sidelines so that's kind of where the focus is is to dial in what we have and slowly add in so right now like I said every time i change a size you know if i want like that sidewinder that you're seeing on there it catches all the way down to florida um they get some monster jacks on that thing in florida and that's my next destination is to go down there and, and, and have fun with that but it has such a such great action and its profile in the water it swims a bunch of different ways you know you, you can stick bait it you know you can you can straight retrieve it and it's got a nice waggle to it um it's suspending so it goes nice and slow and it flutters down we needed a bigger version. So that's the one I'm holding in my hands right now where I was telling you the story about the wire through and how it all held together. So it's nice to know that the durability of this bigger one, and we're going to get the same, uh, all the same effects as a small one, but it has to come under a new mold. It's an entire new project. Uh, even though it's identically, it looks the same, just bigger. So that's, that's kind of where the focus is. As you can see, we took the Hellfire series and really, spread it out to cover a bunch of sizes. Um, there's floating, there's sinking, you know, every time we do something like that, it's, it's an investment. So instead of just putting out a smattering of anything I can get my hands on, we're really trying to dial in and develop. 
which you'll see will take some it will take some time until I can you know quit the day job and uh, yeah. get <laughs> spend twenty four hours straight on this stuff. It would be amazing. <laughs> so, what made you want to get into making your own lures? Um, I think so. A lot of stuff, uh, and probably guys you talk to, guys that you know pour lead. That's exactly how we started. Yeah. We were pouring lead. That you know, wasn't the biggest fan of that, um, but it was kind of how we had to start. Uh, again, we didn't. I didn't know we'd be here right now. Um, so in my in our mind, when we started that, that's where we were going to be and growing and making a million lead casting jigs and. Uh, anything made out of lead <laughs> because we could source everything. We could do it all and got an airbrush. We're painting these things. I have a bunch of them here at the shop um, and they're kind of mementos at this point. Like, I still love them. They'll, they'll request them um, just because they really catch fish. But um, that's how it, that's how it began was, was tinkering around trying to say, we were actually trying to save some money because the other half of fishing out here there's a massive seal population uh, on this island and, and, and on the Cape. And you really wouldn't think it would bother you. It's a good sign fish are around if the seals are there. But if you hook up, it's almost a guarantee. If one's within like 50, 100 yards of you, you're not going to get it in. And that's that you, that's, starts from the dead, dead of summer, middle, end of October. There's certain beaches that are worse than others, but it is incredible. If you looked at like the... Instagram profile I have there. There's quite a few pictures of just heads with um, the lure in the mouth. <laughs> I, yeah, I know that so, pain. I hate that pain, but I know that pain. Bad, but that's I mean, and that's when we were just just fishing. You know, uh, we didn't have a company, anything like that. And I'd go through two hundred dollars in uh, epoxy jigs in a weekend. I and it was, but it was crack. I, I couldn't help myself. I'd go back to the tackle store and just be like, all right, this sucks, but let's do it. Just load up again. And I'd cast it back out there, catch it, lose it, catch it. Oh my God. So yeah, it, I hit a, I hit a wall of, of frustration at some point in the amount of money I was losing out there. But you know, we came across these, yeah, you know, I like do it. They started with the, the do it molds. Um, anyone, you know, if you're ever interested, you can always start there um, and, and learn about, you know, Pouring lead's not great, but, you know, you can do it. Uh, they have soft plastic stuff. You know, you can always kind of get involved in that capacity. I still get the magazines. I forget what they mean, but they send me all the stuff with all, like, the little molds and paints and, I mean, everything. And a lot of stuff I've kind of uh, specialized in what I have now, so I don't really uh, get a lot from them. But if you're starting, like, it's the greatest thing ever. We were ordering from them all the time. You could, I think you can actually order lead directly from them. But... Uh, oh. That's how it all really started was in COVID. We were at first looking to re replenish our supply of lead jigs that we could use. And we had a ton of failed ones because we didn't realize that, you know, in painting these things, it's just not the easiest thing ever. There's a lot of steps. There's a lot of processes to get them to actually stand up to fish, you know, um, and soft lead alone stuff. Because once it moves and bends a little bit, the paint just pops off. But that opened the door. That opened the door, and then we started really digging and looking for, you know, hooks. We were, we were getting killed on hook prices. We were looking for hooks. And I just started stumbling down and getting lost in the bowels of the internet. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got connected with a supplier of hooks, and then I got connected. They, I started asking questions, and we were able to get some raw blanks of a few things. And you know, that's kind of how that first year went. Is it was like being at a buffet and I'll have one of everything. Now there's not any of that stuff still left on our uh, offerings, but we came across what looked like the 180 before we started changing it around. And that's where it all, it, 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 it basically really set in that we were doing this um, because that lure became very, very successful. So it was kind of the foot in the door that we needed to, get that ball rolling and now it's the ball's rolling you just got to control it you know and yeah. make sure that you know money spent in the right areas and doing the right things so that you know if this thing does get a chance to really fly that you know it's prepared it's prepared to do so so 
that's kind of what we're doing right now is just really trying to bring a uh, release some interesting uh, but highly effective plugs that can work for you know certain guys and certain applications um, specifically but also have that real universal feel where you know a lot of guys come here uh, where we live on the island and fish for a week they don't know what to use what they need and these lures are one of the most uh, advertised to them through the shops to grab because they're user friendly and there's a really good percentage chance that you're going to hook up in the time you spend on the water so that's that's what's most rewarding is that you know they're uh, these are favored for that around here that we built following and uh, we get the support that we do. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's big. Word of mouth business is huge. Uh, on your... Yeah, that's what we rely on. I mean, marketing so expensive. It's hell oh, yeah, it is. It's peach of the choir there. I mean, hell. I mean, I, 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 I mean the podcast is, this is the funny thing about podcasting, man. You're like, um, how do I market this? You talk. Wait, what? <laughs> and then you hope mm-hmm. it works out and you get to the right listeners and they're happy with it. And then you can only hope for shares. So marketing, yeah, marketing is a beast in itself. 